I'm very honored actually to be in this medical uh, session because I'm not a doctor at all, as uh, you certainly could understand from my question. Um, I'm a lawyer, uh, but so I've been working for the Lymphoma Coalition since 2015, and I'm in charge of uh, the European branch of the, YEPA, uh, of, the, of the Lymphoma Coalition. So, which means that I work with all our European members, and we have a rather large conception of Europe because it includes, so it goes to Russia, it includes Turkey also, and it also includes Israel. So that's um, 20, 27 countries in which we have members. So I, I need that one. So I will actually present you um, a report we've been um, doing um, in Europe on CLL. And that's actually um, the European version of, the, of a glo global report we've been doing on the same topic. No. Okay. No? I got it wrong. So is that? Okay. Okay. So. Um, I would like to start quickly um, with presenting how we something not, is not working. How we work. Um, so, um, how do we produce the data, and why do we produce this data? So, actually, producing uh, reliable information on lymphoma and for the lymphoma quality, uh, the lymphoma community, is at the basis of, at, at the core of the mission of the lymphoma coalition. Um, and how do we do that? Um, we actually have a different sources of information. Um, the first source is our global database. And what do we do with this global database? Uh, we collect information on access to drugs, access to treatments. Uh, we collect information on clinical trials for 18 different subtypes of lymphoma. And we include in these subtypes CLL. Um, we also do every two years um, a patient survey, um, which is a global survey and which is about um, the patient experience, so the whole patient experience. So the very um, last survey was uh, this year at the beginning of 2016, and we had um, over 4,100 4, answers, and 10% were CLL patients, which means that we got about um, for 415 respondents were CLL patients. And that's the information we used uh, in order to produce this report. Um, we also get information from the medical community because we have a medical advisory board and we also work um, with um, key opinion leaders on different diseases in order to produce our reports. And the last one is what we call our resource library, which is the only information which is accessible to our members only on our website, because all the rest of information is completely freely accessible to anybody. Um, and this resource library uh, contains about 2,500 2, articles um, about every single uh, research uh, and papers and guidelines and even uh, documents published by the regulators and, and funding institutions which might be of interest of our uh, lymphoma um, patient groups. So we use all this information to produce these uh, subtype reports. And we've been working on different subtypes, actually. There are currently seven available on our website. And um, so CLL is kind of an exception, because kind of a test, I would say, because it's the first uh, disease for which we've had um, a European version of uh, these reports. So why do we produce these reports? Um, so we produce these reports mainly for our members. And um, we, we, so this information should be used in, in different ways. The first one is for advocacy purposes. So that's not a scientific report, that's a report which is a tool 
in order to enhance your advocacy at national level. So, which, which means that you have data to present to, uh, you know, we, we had the presentation of the different stakeholders, when you talk to the HTA bodies, when you talk to the regulators, when you talk to health, the healthcare professionals, or when you talk to the industry, you have data uh, on, on the basis of which you can uh, dis discuss with your stakeholders. Um, because we actually, so we produce global and European reports, but we actually train our members about how they can find the information in our global database and in the patient survey to create their national information so that they can use this national information to talk to their own stakeholders. Because we all know that the key issue when we talk about access is funding, and funding is still a very national matter. And that's something you need to discuss at national level. So access to CLL therapies in Europe. So what, what did we do actually? Uh, again, yeah. So um, we, we've been um, basing our, um, so our research on uh, the ESMO guidelines and on the um, NCCN listing, uh, which means that at the end we had uh, 25 listed therapies. Uh, so specific for uh, CLL, um, which were our baseline in order to understand which of these drugs were approved in the different countries and which of these drugs were funded. Um, what we found out actually is that 13 of these 27, uh, 25 listed therapies were approved in all or most West European countries. And um, so we had, um, so I, I told you at the beginning, we have 27 countries, member countries in Europe. And in this case, we had um, 13 in West European, uh, in West, in West European uh, countries and uh, 14 East European countries. And what we found out is that um, the therapy approval in uh, Eastern European countries is uh, very similar when these countries are part of the EU, but obviously uh, very different when these countries are not part of the EU because of the EMA, and that's very, very um, easy to understand. Um, but the difference is, is very, very big, which means that um, in, uh, in EU countries, uh, even if they are part of Eastern Europe, we had levels which are very close to the 13 uh, drugs approved, therapies approved, and in non-EU countries, we, we go down to three drugs approved in some countries, six, drug, six drugs approved in other countries, so much lower level, which means that um, in these countries, patients may not have access to um, the standard and even very basic therapies. So what is one of the main issues? Um, the main issue as we get access to drugs is the funding of novel therapies. And I, I'm sure that's not a surprise for any of you. And um, we, in this case, we have huge discrepancies between uh, East and West, which does mean that we do well and we do good in Western Europe, because you can see the numbers. So that's um, for, uh, so we just took a few examples. For obinutuzumab plus carambacil, we have reimbursement in nine uh, Western European countries and three Eastern European countries. So um, there is a big difference. And again, same thing for uh, alfatumimab and chlorambucil. And, and it's even worse for uh, ibrutinib, eight countries versus just one country. Uh, but when you know that we had for, uh, 13 countries in uh, Western Europe and 13 countries in Eastern Europe, we are not doing very well in uh, Western Europe either. So, but we'll see afterwards whether that's really, really the main issue for patients. So what about clinical trials activity? So we've been comparing uh, phase two and phase three clinical trials in, um, in CLL versus other lymphoma subtypes. 
And what is interesting is that um, there is a huge proportion of uh, CLL trials right now, and uh, especially with respect to um, other lymphoma subtypes. And, um, and actually, that's very um, interesting to understand that um, even in the countries in which you have very few trials, like in Lithuania, um, and you, you, have just one, you, you have just two trials, for instance, in uh, Lithuania in lymphoma, and these two trials are CLL trials. So, which means that um, I wouldn't say that it's a, it's a lucky subtype, certainly not, and that's not a good cancer, but that's a cancer in which there is a huge activity in terms of clinical trials right now. So, how do these trials look like? Um, so, we compared um, two different things. So first, let's talk about where these trials take place. So you see that we have 226 trials um, at global level. And you can see a rather big disproportion between Western European countries and Eastern European countries. That's not unusual. That's the same kind of data we have for many, many kinds of disease, not only in lymphoma, but also in other kinds of disease. Um, but what is interesting in, in this case, so you have like uh, the proportion is one to three because you have 26 in uh, Eastern Europe and 73 in, in Western Europe. But um, guess what? In which country uh, are the, most, the most important quantity of clinical trials happening? Obviously in the US. So 78% of trials in CLL are in the US. So, where, so the geographical localization of clinical trials uh, varies a lot. Uh, another data which is rather interesting is that um, most clinical trials in CLL involve novel therapies. You can see the data over there, and that's not the case for all subtypes. That's something very, very special um, for CLL. And now let's go to the barriers to treatment. I think it's a very interesting slide because actually you can compare the barriers to treatment um, so both at global level in uh, Western Europe and in Eastern Europe. And the first element which strikes me is uh, the access to up-to-date treatment. So that's, that's a big issue. That's a big issue at global level. That's a big issue in uh, Eastern Europe. It is less of an issue in Western Europe, but still, that's not the main issue for patients. And that's something we need to think about. Um, so as you see, um, in, in Eastern Europe, the main issue is access to the treatment center. How can you get access to the centers which are able to treat you for your specific disease. The second issue is financial concerns. When the drugs are not reimbursed or, or are partially reimbursed, obviously financial concerns um, are in the, in the front line. Uh, and again, you see a rather big difference between the issues in Eastern Europe and in Western Europe. The main issue in Western Europe is personal support. So, psychosocial impact of CLL in the different region. I will be rather quick on that one uh, because I know that um, there will be a presentation tomorrow uh, by Pierre about um, studies they did on psychosocial impact. And um, I just would like to raise your attention about the fear of relapse. That's something we've not been discussing much until now, but that's a data which um, is huge in uh, all lymphoma subtypes. And for CLL, it seems to be a, a, very, a, pregnant, a very important issue also. And we are just wondering whether that's an issue uh, sufficiently discussed uh, between patients 
and uh, their doctors. So in, in the, I will um, give you the report afterwards, which is here. I printed uh, plenty of copies, so you can have each have one. So you, you will be able to find a lot of other information in that, especially on, um, on medical aspects and medical impact and, and physical impact of the disease. And you will see data uh, which confirm what we all know is that, for instance, Fatigue is a huge issue uh, and it is a, really the most important issue uh, with respect to any other issue for, um, for patients. So, very last slide. Um, support from healthcare professionals. So, we realized something uh, based on the survey we did, which is that um, so 70% of the patients uh, with CLL, but it was true for every subtype. So 70% of the patients which talk uh, to their doctors about um, the side effects, about especially the psychosocial issues they're living, are not really satisfied by the answers they receive. So um, they either say that it was not helpful at all, but most of them say that it was somewhat helpful, but it, not, it was not you know, a solution to their problems. So what shall we do? What shall we do and what shall we do together? Um, I think that's something on which um, patient groups can help a lot and they can help a lot with um, information and they can help a lot with support. So um, I think that's really an area in which we need to work together with healthcare professionals. We need to work together with hematologists. And, uh, but for that, uh, we need to make sure that these doctors refer patients to patient groups. And we know that it's not always the case. We had wonderful doctors here uh, which, wo which work really hand in hand with all else, uh, with uh, the patients group in their own countries. But we know our experience is that it's not always the case. So the credibility of patient organization is something essential. And, uh, and the partnership to establish with the healthcare uh, professional is something on which we need to focus. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any question and if you have some time, you can do that. Charlotte, that was fascinating. Some very interesting data. And, and there was a couple of personal points for myself I've actually picked out from that data that I want to investigate. Was, um, there is, there is um, quite a bit of time left for questions. So it's a great opportunity to have some debate on this data and questions to, to Charlotte as well. Please. Hello, I'm uh, Toon Hansen from the Norwegian Bloodcaster Association. I don't know if you are the right person to address my question to, and it's not really just the question. It's more of a, a way of thinking that I really haven't seen here on this conference yet. Because uh, in, uh, in Norway, I've been involved in something that's called evidence-based research. And after sitting here, I've been shown so much research going on it seems like, wow, the more research, the better. But is that necessarily true? That's what I want to address here. Because a lot of research that's been done uh, might not be good research for several reasons. It could be also dangerous for patients to participate. And we know that research money is scary. It's not much money for research. So it's important to use this money wisely. And then to think about, there is so much going on all over the world with different sorts of resources. What about uh, using what they're doing, Cochrane would have these sort of reviews about what have been done before. And you very often say that when it comes to research, of course, you should stand on the shoulders to the researchers before you. But yes, that might be true. But still, when they look into references, what is it? Who do they pick? one who's famous in the field, 
or the cited study who's been cited very often is not necessarily the best studies to cite from because what you really need is an overview of all what has been done on the field before. So you, have, you need systematic reviews. And of course, sometimes it's useful to repeat the studies because you need to see what's effective. But at some time, you could actually stop. You don't need to repeat this sort of studies anymore because you actually know the answer. And what happens if you just keep carrying on is that you actually do research that's redundant and maybe even harmful for patients. So that was just a different idea that I haven't heard here today at this Congress. Thank you. So I can obviously not answer about clinical research. I can just answer about what we've been doing. And as I told at the very beginning, you need to take that report as an advocacy tool. And that's a tool we developed for our members. I will just take uh, one example, which is uh, the access to drug and the reimbursement of treatments. Finding information in all the different countries about reimbursement of treatments is a real nightmare. In some countries, rather few of them, you have a nice list of all the treatments reimbursed published on a, on a website of the government or of the, of the reimbursement agency, and that's just wonderful. But that's not you know, the rule, it's rather the exception. And what happens is that in many countries, uh, the information is not published, or it's even secret in some countries, and I'm not kidding, that's crazy. We, we really realized, discovered incredible things. In some countries, you have like at least three levels of decision. You have the national level, you have the regional level, because in many countries, so uh, the, the healthcare is regionalized, and then you have the hospital level. And so to know whether patients have really access to the drugs, is very, very difficult. So that's on, on this specific question, um, we would very much like to have feedback uh, from the different countries on does it reflect reality in your countries? And if it does not, please let's work together in order to improve that data and to make sure that the public institution um, publish this data because it should be publicly available to patients. Thank you, Charlotte. Natasha, you have a question, I believe. I'm Natasha from Spain. Uh, I'm here on behalf of HAEAL. We are members of Lymphoma Coalition, and I want to thank uh, the effort to, to do this research because it provides a starting point now to work together to improve the situation. And following your last comment, uh, the Spanish health system even when we have reimbursement for most of the medicines. You, uh, in, in this report, we discovered that, for example, for CLL, we have 20 treatments approved, but just four of them at the moment of the study was um, receiving reimbursement. But we have discovered later that even for those who have reimbursement, in certain regions or in certain hospitals, there are kind of recommendations not to provide those treatments for patients. So I think this information, this kind of research needs to be done by patient organizations, but we need to have a, what we do next with this information. I, I mean, we need to work now in how to help patients to get support to get access to research, to treatments, to state of the art, uh, to get in contact with reference centers, with hematologists who are in the best position to offer the best guidance. And, and I would love to, to hear Charlotte's comments on what we can do next. So, um, I, so what we're doing right now, and I think that the second step is, um, do capacity building with our members on how to use this information wisely, what you can do with that. How does, uh, does it, is it able to improve your advocacy at national level? And, and so that's, uh, so the next and the third step is not for us to decide, obviously. That's a, a, a national decision of every single member organization about 
which are the main issues you, work to, uh, you want to work on at national level. Because that's an instrument also to guide your actions and to guide your activities because it evidences issues. So it evidences and, and it evidences also obviously patients and met needs. So on, on which do you want to uh, concentrate in order to improve the situation in your own country? So to answer your question, uh, the next step in my opinion is capacity building. And that's one of the reasons why these, these meetings are so, so useful. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Natasha. We are coming to, to a close here. I think one of the things that's quite inspirational is to have you talking here um, and also that the CLL Advocates Network are looking to talk with your organization and work together in collaboration so that we don't reinvent the wheels. And you know, to some degree with regards to the question about the research that, that we don't replicate each other's, that we actually work together and allow capacity building so that we can uh, address this. Because without a doubt, the key issue within CLL at the moment is access.